All right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Harvest. Woo. We're in a cold mess behind there. Oh, man. So, everybody have a good week? Yep. Awesome. We're on. The thumbs up. Okay. Well, I was just telling these guys back here that I think that um, that God has just been reminding me that he's in charge and that uh, my faith just needs to always reside in him. And I just want to just pray about that for a second and just think about it and um, we'll start worship. Uh, God, we love you and we just want to thank you for giving us a chance to be together today and just lift up your name and just know that you're God and just know that we are children of God. And we love you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.
let us become more aware of your presence let us experience the glory of your goodness let us become more aware of your presence let us experience the glory of your goodness let us become more aware of your
you guys can take a minute and greet each other, okay? God of covenant and faithful promises. Time and time again, you have proven you'll do this what you say. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast. And let my heart learn when you speak a word, it will come to pass. Great your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness to me. From the rising sun to the setting same, I will praise your Thank you. 
we just ended up in the wrong key, didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> okay, you guys can have a seat, and we're going to go ahead and do communion. Good morning, everybody. Uh, first of all, I just want to welcome everybody here. Um, this is our time of communion. So whether you're here or online, you might not have the cup in front of you, but this is still the communion time, so I encourage you to participate, to, to come at this uh, with the same spirit as if you were here. Um, so I'm going to start out with a little story. Um, how many of you guys remember your first car, the first car that you had? Was it like, was it just everything you ever expected it to be? Just like this, <laughs> this amazing thing, the greatest purchase you ever made? My first car was, um, my parents would disagree, um, but my first car was a 1990 Camaro. It was the T-top, it was just everything I could have hoped. Um, the cars I had after that, though, were pretty bad. Um, they got progressively worse. And I want to talk to you about one of those cars. So when I was uh, in college, the Camaro had already died. Um, I had to I sold it for junk. Uh, and then I had a van after that that fell apart that was my grandma's. That was pretty bad. And so then I finally saved up enough money with the assistance of my parents to get the truck that I had always wanted, <coughs> supposedly. So this was a 2000 Chevy S10, um, four-wheel drive, you know, crew cab. It was, it was everything I wanted. I probably paid like uh, five to 7,000. I can't remember exactly how much it was, um, but this was my truck, right? And then over the course of the next 10 years that I had this, I probably put $10,000 into it in repairs um, because this truck turned out that it was a piece of junk. But it was my truck, right? I remember specifically one time when I was in Michigan, um, I was driving somewhere and this, it just it idled rough for about a year um, and I didn't really have money at that time to fix things so I just kind of like prayed a lot and then did what I could. And so it was getting pretty bad so I pulled over into the AutoZone parking lot thinking like, oh, I'll, you know, I'll open the hood up and I'll see something wrong and be like, oh, clearly that's it and then go in and get a part and fix it. Um, that's about my extent of knowledge with trucks. So I opened the hood up and I had no idea what I was doing. So I go in and I, I get one of the guys to come out and I'm like, hey, I see this like little wire thing sticking up. That's probably important, right? And he had no idea exactly what it was, but sure enough, we found somewhere that it looked like it went. So we used some duct tape and got it going again. And then I started the car up and drove away. And I still had the idling problem, um, but it turned out that my cruise control worked now because apparently <laughs> that's what that was. And so that, that truck wasn't worth the 5000 that I paid for it, and I already owned it, and yet I just continued to pump money into it. I probably paid two or three times what it was worth over the course of the time that I had it, and I would like to say that that's because I needed it, uh, but that wasn't true. I could have sold it and got something better for the money that I paid and put into it. I think it was because I wanted it. I, you know, I'd had the Camaro, I'd had the cool car, and I was just tired of driving, you know, four-door sedans. I wanted a truck, right? A man should have a truck. So I wanted it. And that got me thinking, actually, of a story in the Bible. We were going over this in Bible study, and um, it kind of, the same thing kind of applied, right? Just like with that truck, the value of that truck was not in the truck itself. To me, the truck itself was probably only worth a couple thousand, but I was willing to put in, you know, 15,000 because I wanted to keep that truck. And that got me thinking when we were going to Bible study, we we're going through Hosea. So if any of you have read this or are familiar with it, um, it's a pretty complicated book and you probably look at it at first glance and think, you know, there's a lot of stuff in here that I don't know about. Um, but basically, short story, Hosea is God's prophet and he tells Hosea, hey, um, you're going to go marry this woman. She's going to be an adulteress and you are going to keep going after her. In that time, under Moses' law, right, women were the property of the husband, and if a woman was adulterous, depending on the situation, the punishment was stoning to death, right? So in Hosea 3, um, God tells Hosea, hey, I want you to go get your wife back, this adulterous wife, and it, something interesting happens here. So the Lord said to me, Go show your love to your wife again. Though she is loved by another man and is an adulteress, love her as the Lord loves the Israelites. Though they turn to other gods and love their sacred raisin cakes, 
So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and about an omer of lethic of barley. So what happened here is Hosea was going to get his wife back, a wife that he already owns. He's already married to her. It's his wife. She's stepped out of the marriage and is committing adultery. And he goes back and has to pay this man to get his own wife back. And it kind of got me thinking, like, why would somebody pay to get their own wife back? And Sam asked this question, right, in our Bible study, and he said, who do you think set the price, right? Why, did, why was it 15 shekels of silver, an omer, a lethic of barley? Why, what, what was that price, right? And so he asked this question, and I thought about it, and my answer was, well, Gomer set the price, right? Because she was already married, and somebody else came and made her an offer, and at some point she said, okay, for that price, right, I'm going to step out of this marriage. But that's not really the case. The case, the price really was death. The law set the price. By committing adultery, by all rights, she should have been stoned to death. And she knew that, but she did it anyway. But here comes Hosea, who could have just taken his wife back from this man, and if this man had found out that she was married, he wouldn't have asked for any money. It would have been, okay, t take her, you know, don't, please don't drag me into this when you stone her. You know, I didn't know. That would have been the reaction. But instead, he went back and got her, and he paid for her. He paid a price for something that he already had so that he could redeem her. He didn't take her out to be stoned. She didn't face a punishment. Instead, he brought her back, and he loved her. And that got me thinking about communion. So this time during our service, uh, when we celebrate communion, it's not just about remembering a sacrifice that was made. It's about so much more. It's about every possible aspect of God that you could think about, including value. You see, when Jesus died on the cross, he bought us. He already owned us. We were already his. He made us. He didn't have to do that. The price for our sin was death, and we knew that. And he didn't have to pay it, but he chose to. Not because we are inherently valuable, because we were worth it, or that we deserved it, but because he loved us that much, that he was willing to pay that price. And I think Drew Wright uh, made a really good point last week that during this time of communion, really try to come at it this year if you haven't, from a different perspective. Don't just take this as a time in the service where you realize that we only have two worship songs left before Sam preaches, but this is actually a time when you can come to God with a new perspective, with an open mind, and just seek him. Communion can be about sacrifice. It can be about love. It can be about God's mercy. It shows us the value that he places on us. It shows us how to be a leader, how to be a servant. It shows us so many things. So during this time, I just want you to consider that. Um, what it means, what it tells you about the love that God has for you, that he put that value on you. So will you pray with me? Um, Lord, we just thank you. We thank you for the sacrifice that you made. We thank you for the love that you have for us and that you were willing to pay something that you didn't have to pay to bring us back so that we could have a relationship with you. Um, and during this time of communion, I just pray that we would, uh, that we would seek that relationship that we would seek you, we would seek to know you and know what you say about us and why it is that you value us in this way. In your name, amen.
Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope with no place to be again Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested and my life began Oh, your grace so free washes over me You have made me new, now life begins with you It's your
worship you. I worship you. You are here working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. And you are here. are dismissed. Good morning. <clears throat> We're live. We're live. Have you ever glued something back together? It's not as good as it was originally. 
is it? You ever had to glue something more than once, right? It's just not bonding, it's not taking. Um, <clears throat> what I've noticed about life is life is kind of broken. And um, uh, I want you to know something really, really cool about God. That nobody can do what God can do. So God is um, a God who restores he doesn't just glue things back together. God doesn't just, you know, duct tape the car, right? He doesn't just duct tape it back together. He literally takes our broken pieces. He takes what we have messed up, and he has the miraculous ability to actually restore things. At the end of this month, we have a conference that we're doing, a Sharing Life conference. We do it every year. It is a big deal. Um, the reason why it's such a big deal is because God is there. And we take uh, Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday morning, and it is our conference. And the theme for this year I absolutely love. It's restore, and it's this idea that God wants to restore us back to himself. God wants to restore us back to the body. God wants to restore us to one another, and God wants to restore us, even in our own lives, back to ourselves. And so you don't want to miss the Sharing Life Conference. It would be a huge miss if you didn't show up to the Sharing Life Conference. But if you do show up, you're going to wish at the end of it that you brought somebody else with you. And so I want to challenge you here and now I want this year, I think it's so important, restoration to be restored is such a big deal. And so many people need it. And especially this time of year, this time in the season of the world even, I think people need restoration. And so if, you, um, I, I, if you'll take on a challenge, I would challenge you to invite somebody to this conference to come and hear some speakers talk about restoration. We've got a guy out of Indianapolis, Indianapolis coming who's at, I think, Indian Creek. Is that where Shan's at? And, uh, you know, he uh, does speaking at CIY, and he does a lot of different things. He's just a great guy. we got a guy coming out of Florida that's coming here to speak to us. And we've got just some good people coming. We've got a guy out of Michigan that's going to come and uh, lead the worship. And so... It is going to be such a big deal, and it's, and it's going to be here before we know it. Restore. Um, there's another thing that's taking place. Back here every Wednesday night, um, after our prayer meeting, we have these guys, these group of guys that have been meeting, and it's, uh, we call it the Light Bearers group. I, I don't know, for some reason, I thought it'd be kind of interesting to have a class, a preaching class, where we just challenge some guys, say, hey, you, ever, you want to write a sermon? And if I've missed you for this round, maybe next round you'll say, hey, next time you have that class, I want to be in because I know Baron wants to preach up here at some point. Right, Baron? <laughs> but that class has been really, really awesome for me because um, I've seen the hearts of some people that are just really um, uh, interested in pouring out of something, letting God pour something out of them from him. And uh, we've got, I think there's 12 guys that are in that class. And the unique thing about it is when I uh, thought about having that class, it had nothing to do with this motorcycle trip I'm going to take. But it just connected. I thought, of course this is what you're doing, God. So these guys, some of them have never preached a sermon before and are very, very nervous. <laughs> They're going to preach in March and April. Every week we're going to have a, uh, somebody else bringing God's word. And so March and April, we as a movement, Harvest, we're going to spread the gospel around the world. I'm going to be speaking in 13 countries in Africa, and there's going to be people speaking God's truth here that's just as relevant and just as needed. So I want you to be, the reason why I bring it up is because I want you to be praying about our Sharing Life Conference. I want you to be praying about this movement that's happening, that's so unique, I think, and so different that's happening in March and April through you and through this church and around the world. So be praying for that, and let's see what God can do. Um, I'm going to pray, 
and then I'm going to share what God's given me uh, with you from his word. Uh, will you pray with me? Uh, God, thank you for your grace and your mercy. God, I thank you that we get to be in your presence because you are the way maker. God, you are the miracle worker. You're the, ones that, you're the one that, that, that does what we cannot. You understand us, God. You, you, you created us. And I love, just absolutely love the truth during the communion time uh, that Drew shared, that you purchased us back and you set the value for us. God, help us not to think any other value but the value you've put on us. It sure changes everything. God, you are love and you're great. We love you. Be with us. Speak, God. I, I ask you to speak. It's in Christ's name. Amen. So we're in this series uh, called Stumbling Block, Stepping Stones or Stumbling Blocks. You, somebody asked me just this week, hey, these rocks, what are they about? And uh, they're about a choice. They're a symbol to, to say you have a choice. You can, you can take things in this world and you can make them a stumbling block where you just can't get past it, right, where it wrecks your world. Or you can take things in this world and say, hey, they're going to be a stumbling or a stepping stone where I glorify God and I, and I grow closer to God and his impact is greater in my life. So stepping stone or stumbling block, you really got to decide. And I've chosen five things that I, I'm talking to you about. Started the 26th of December and we talked about possessions, right? <clears throat> and the idea is that we're talking about as we look into 2022. Uh, don't you want 2022? There's not anyone in here that doesn't want 2021, 2022 to be this, this incredible year where, where God's blessing is just on us and we're sharing God's love and the movement of God grows. And how, how many of you would love more of your family members to get to know Jesus, right? And for people to surrender to Christ. We want the movement of God in our lives to grow this year. So we're talking about these five things, these possessions. Last week we talked about position. Everybody has a position in their life that can be a stumbling block or a stepping stone. Today I want to talk to you about a, talk to you about a different topic. But I have to ask you a question first. How many of you have ever smashed your thumb or your finger with a hammer? Raise your hand, please. How many of you have done it more than 10 times? <laughs> more than uh, 25 times, do you think? You think anybody more than 25 times? Brian, don't lie. <laughs> Come on now. You were construction for so long, right? Uh, right, right. I have this, this dark spot on my thumbnail that's just now growing out, right? It's just now growing out. That was oddly, it was a drill, I think, that went around and whacked my finger. And, but if you've ever smacked your thumb or smacked your finger, uh, what came out of you? I mean, let's, let's be honest, right? If it, it, it just is, this is my what happens to me not every time, but I, it's it's this number right <laughs> right where you where you walk around and you're like oh my gosh oh and you're yelling you're hollering maybe you're jumping up and down whatever you're doing and you can literally your heart somehow went from your chest and it traveled down your arm right underneath your heart your whole heart is underneath that thumbnail you know the feeling right it's going bam bam bam. And then there's always that happy person that's next to you. Say, What'd you do? And they want to talk to you. And you don't want to, what do you want? You don't want to talk to them, do you? You want to transfer the pain that's underneath your fingernail to their jaw or to them. You know, say, feel this. This is how I feel. No, I don't want to talk. I can't talk. I can't talk. It's out. Pain. I, praise is not the natural product of pain. Have you noticed? Have you noticed that praise is not the natural product of pain? I want to talk to you about suffering uh, today. That's our topic. I want to talk to you about pain. Again, um, I've noticed that when I smack my finger, when bad things happen, right? It's the grand question that everybody's asking. If God's so loving, then why does bad things happen to good people, right? Pain, suffering. We're talking about that, and, and the question is, is, is the pain that you're going to experience this year, is it going to be a, a stepping stone or a stumbling block? 
Praise is not the natural product of pain, but it is our calling. Praise is our calling. Praise in the presence of suffering has the power to transform a pain-filled stumbling block into a pain-filled platform for God's glory and your benefit. I want you to hear that again. I'm going to stumble through it one more time because I want you to grab onto it because this is the premise that I'm sharing today. Praise in the presence of suffering has the power to transform a pain-filled stumbling block into a pain-filled platform for God's glory and our blessing. Now, notice I didn't take away the pain. Praise makes it go away. No, it doesn't. It sure doesn't. This praise is, is, I think, what we're called to, no matter what the landscape of our life is doing, no matter how we're doing, no matter how the year goes. There's no excuse. Whether it's pain, your day is full of storms, or your day is full of calm, great, sunny, beautiful moments. Praise is our calling. But that praise is going to cost you something. I, I would guess that every single one of us has had uh, plenty of pain in our life. In, in fact, I know the sad reality is that we're going to experience much more pain in the upcoming days. You're going to suffer this year. I hate to be in the, the bearer of bad news, but we are going to experience pain this year for sure. Uh, count on it. But the question really is, will that pain take us down or will it lift God up? Will it be this, this stumbling block or will it be the stepping stone? Uh, perhaps, I, I got to thinking about this uh, this week, perhaps the greatest stumbling block in our world is pain. You know, the other things that I've talked about, possessions and position, really you don't think of those as stumbling blocks, right? You think of those as blessings. Hey, that's awesome. But pain is something that everybody can agree is a major, wait, wait a minute here, whoa, hold, hold up here. I think it may be the greatest thing that we stumble over when we suffer and when there's pain. You know, when bad things happen, no one says it first. Oh, that's amazing. Hey, that's great. I love it. Thank you, God. Man, this is so wonderful. I didn't realize that, that my life being shattered was so wonderful. Praise God. Nobody says that naturally, right? Let's be honest. Pain is such a huge obstacle. And I think that we do a disservice to the process of people getting through that pain to just kind of overlook it or overshadow and say, well, come on, just, let, just praise God in it. I think sometimes we're careless with people's pain. It, it, we have to be honest with it. It is, is such a massive stumbling block. It's such a massive obstacle. And, and we don't need to pretend that it's not. And we, we also don't need to pretend that we like it. I, I've seen the genuineness of our witness sometimes hurt because we were, for some reason, afraid to share with people that we're bummed out or that we're sad or that we're crushed or that we're devastated, that we're not all smiles, that we're, we're, it's okay to be weak, it's okay to be broken, it's okay to not like what you're going through. But I want you to know that pain can be a stepping stone if you choose to celebrate God in it, and you choose to trust Him. Isn't that the time that's hard to trust God? Because what we want so many times is we want understanding. God, I want to know why. And so a lot of people are just saying, no, I'm not taking another step until you tell me why. There, I'm, I'm just... I want you to know that that is the world. That's where the world's at. They're devastated. They're, they're hurt. Even if they're smiling to you and things are going good financially or good in their position or good with whatever, 
most of the world is stepping back and saying, not another step, God, until you tell me why. Pain's such a big obstacle. Our passage today, there's three, uh, three chapters in the book of Acts that we're going to talk about today. And it's really, it's an assignment for you this week. It's Acts chapters 6, 7, and 8. And I want you to read those chapters this week. But let me give you a little bit of background. Right? So the whole Old Testament it carries one message. That message is, I'm coming to get you. Right? It's, it's, it's a lot of stories. But it's God saying, I'm coming to get you. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I'm here. Life of Jesus. But the book of Acts is my church is here. So the book of Acts is a very unique uh, part of Scripture because it's really how do we know what church is? How do we know what to do? Why we do communion is because in the book of Acts, they got together, they broke bread, they remembered the body and blood of Jesus, and they did this, and so that's why we do it. Why do we baptize? Well, because in the book of Acts, that's what they did. Why do we do the things that we do? We look in the history book. The book of Acts is the history of the church. My church is here. I'm here. My church is here. And so as you track through the book of Acts, there's, there's this message that's going out. And um, it's a really a powerful one. And these, um, these chapters right here, something happens that they record an amazing time for the church. They record a mountaintop time for the church. The church is growing like crazy. Great things are happening. Do you know um, how many were added to the number that day after the very first sermon was preached, after Jesus went up and the Holy Spirit came down? How many were added to that number that day? 3,000. 3,000 were baptized that day, right? Were added to the number. The church was really booming. Great things were happening. In fact, there was such a surge and it was so, such a mountaintop time that they were seemingly invincible. In fact, there was a lar- the Bible says there were a large number of priests becoming obedient to the faith. Side note. Jesus said to his church, he said, I want you to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, out to Judea, out to Samaria, and out to the other ends of the earth. So you get that progression? Out. I don't know that I'll get into it, but I want, I want you to know that that's what Jesus commanded the church. But they were posted up, really comfortable, and really killing it in Jerusalem, and that's where they all were. They were packed right in there, and they were growing like crazy. And th- these chapters that I'm giving you to read this week also record the most devastating thing to happen since Jesus died on the cross to the believers of Jesus. Since Jesus was crucified and everybody scattered that was by his side and that was healed by him and that was loved by him, that was resurrected by him, that everything, they all ran away when Jesus hung on the cross. The the most devastating thing on the planet for believers of Jesus and followers of Jesus was what we're reading today and what we're studying today. It was a massive explosion of suffering and pain. And so, because the church, let me give you some background. Because the church was growing so much, the apostles said, hey, pick seven among you here in Jerusalem. Pick seven among you, known to be full of the Holy Spirit, and known to be just all these things, and have them serve here. And we're, we're, we can't be slowed down by all these things. We need more people. And they picked these seven guys. And in these seven guys was Stephen. And Stephen was a superhero. Like he, he I don't know what the apostles were doing, but the scriptures, I know they were killing it too. But I'm telling you, 
Stephen rose to the top, and he was so amazing, and everybody loved Stephen, and, and he was so powerful in Jerusalem that he actually got the attention of the leaders in Jerusalem. The attention was not good. And they were so concerned and so worried about him that they drummed up these lies about him and said he never stopped speaking against Moses and against the law and all these different things. And they, they, it's, it's a penalty that's, that's going to bring death. It's quite an accusation that they bring in. And Stephen is confronted, and he gives a response. They're like, what do, you, what do you got to say? He gives this response, quite a long response, over 50 verses in the middle there. And it's a, I find it to be quite a calm response. He goes through the history, right, of him, of himself, of Jesus, of the, and, and leads him right to that Jesus is the fulfillment of all these things. It's, a, it's an incredible uh, response to them and then he he turns it up a little notch which makes them mad right you stiff necked people and he and he kind of confronts them with rough truth and they get so angry at him that they drag him out and they stone him to death you know stoning right we we don't really comprehend it because none none of you have ever seen anyone get stoned but stone they'd pick up these stones and they'd throw them at, at people until it smashed them to death so Stephen gets stoned to death, and the church it scatters. I, I want to read, um, actually, your assignment was chapters 6 and 7 until yesterday. I just wanted to read it again, and I wanted to read around it. It's good to read the text around the scripture. You get more context with it, and I did, and so now you've got chapter 8. But I want to read for you. Uh, what took place, uh, look in verse uh, 1 of chapter 8. And this is after Stephen was dead, killed. Uh, this is what happened. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. This is what I want us to recognize. Do you think that there was a Bible study or a gathering in Jerusalem that people liked? Hey, remember that time our gathering won that priest? And he's with us now, him and his family and his children. How awesome is that? See, sometimes we pour over the word and we don't really realize what took place. Do you realize that it says that everyone but the apostles had to pick up ship and move? They scattered. They ran for their lives. And meanwhile... Saul, Paul, is knocking from house to house, door to door, and finding out if you're a believer and taking you to prison. It is mass chaos, and there's so much pain, and there's so much suffering that everybody scatters. And I, and I just find that just to be incredible what takes place. And did you catch this, what Saul was trying to do? He was trying to destroy destroy the church he didn't have good intentions he didn't just want them to correct their ways he wanted to eradicate the movement of jesus on the planet that was the pain that was the suffering that was the loss that took place and so out of this um passage out of this this bit of scripture i want to share with you some some things that I think are going to help in this challenge that we have, this challenge to make our pain, right, a stepping stone instead of this life-altering stumbling block that just really has stopped us and say, I can't, can't take any more, God. And so I want to pass along some things. Uh, the first thing I want to share with you came out of verse 15 of chapter 6. And what's happened is they've accused Stephen. 
They've thrown out the accusations of what he's doing with the lies, and it says that they're looking at him intently. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Uh, not a single person, not a single prophet in the Old Testament that encountered an angel of God, they all did the same thing. Can any of you guess what they did? Huh? They hit their face. They hit their knees. They, they went down. When they encountered the presence of God through an angel, whatever, they're like, Isaiah said, Whoa, I'm a dead man, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean, unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the Lord, right? And, and Ezekiel and all these people throughout, when they encountered God, they were like, Oh, man, I'm dead. I'm unholy. I can't. And it just grabbed me. Um, that these guys looked and they said, look, an angel on Stephen. This is what I want you to grab. This is what I want you to think about. And I want to proclaim this to you. God always shows up when pain shows up. I want you to know that I want to go a little further with that. I've been thinking about this, and I'm just going to throw it out here. I think that that's true for Christians and non-Christians alike. For God so loved the world that he gave his own son, right? God loves the world. God loves everybody. He even loves the people that reject him. God loves mankind. We were created in his image. When pain shows up on the planet, God shows up too. It just doesn't always feel like it. And it's interesting because when God shows up, those around you, if you're suffering in pain, they can actually see it. They know, even if they can't identify it or they choose to ignore it or pretend it's not there. Stephen is painfully beginning down a very rough road. It's a life-ending road, actually. It's a very short road before he's stoned. And the text says that they looked at him and they looked at his face and they could see the face of an angel on Stephen. And no one stops in awe and no one has reverence and says, man, God, I don't know what's going on, but this is a holy moment. This is something. They don't for a minute say that Angel on Stephen's face? Maybe God's on <laughs> Stephen's side and not ours. Wait, let's rethink this. But in their emotions and in their fears and in their pride, they ignore such an unbelievable sight. And that's what's going on in our world today. God absolutely shows up in the center of pain, but the world and we tend to ignore it. It was there for them to see with Stephen. It's there now for people to see. The truth is, when God is our focus, our pain reveals things to other people. Listen, when God is our focus, our pain, and even if God's not your focus, I want you to know that suffering and pain reveals things to other people. And sometimes those things, are, are they're not ready to see them, but they need to. You know, the Word of God says very clearly that God is near to the brokenhearted. God shows up when pain shows up, so don't give up. That's my encouragement to you. The second thing that I want to share with you is this. Always share truth in your trial, no matter how it feels, no matter how it's well it's received, no matter... Um, even if you know that the truth that you have to share with somebody is not going to be received or they're not going to feel good about it. We're in an interesting culture where we want to make everybody feel good. I just want you to feel good. I don't care if, I don't care if you go to hell. I just want you to feel good while you're on earth, okay? 
ultimately, I just want you to like me. You ever looked at a picture of yourself and uh, you, you have that haircut, you know what I'm talking about? That you're like, <laughs> you know, what? and then you have that outfit, right? That you're like, oh man. You know, and I told Sal that we should do this. We should have a picture day where every single one of us at Harvest, you have to bring in your worst, what was going on, picture, and we're going to make a photo book. We're going to make a photo book of everybody and it says, this is Brant, you know, right? <laughs> this is Micaiah. Look at this. this everybody's seen Randy, Randy's famous one, right? This is Randy's. Right? Wouldn't that be fun if we did that? You know, but it's that picture that you look back and, and there's this question that kind of rises to the top, right? I want you to look past that question because that question is this one. What was I thinking? I actually want you to look at the next question that rises up. And that question is, why didn't anybody tell me? Do, do I not have, did I not have any friends that would look at me and be honest with me and say, no, uh-uh, no, do not do that. Whatever it is, don't do that. You know, over the last uh, several, uh, probably months since Africa, I didn't, I haven't done anything. I haven't, my, my, my facial hair was a mess and, you know, I think Jordan said something to me. This something's got to happen around here. She's like, something, I don't remember. It was somebody that said, this isn't, this, something needs to happen. And so last night, Kathy goes, I, I was like hoping she'd forget because I just was so comfortable and was going to go to sleep. And she's like, got to do something about that ugly. <laughs> it's, all, it's, it's done. It's, it's, it's run its course. You know, and so, I, I, it, and as it turns out, I don't look any better than I did before, but at least my hair looks better, right? <clears throat> Why didn't anybody tell me? There's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And I think that question is going to come in. I don't know why, but since the beginning of my redemption... Uh, something that's always moved me. I don't know if it was, stems out of a video that I saw one time about the importance of evangelism, but I've always pictured me holding hands with my best friends and my family members. And Jesus saying, you, you're with me, come on. And them trying to hold on to my hand because they're not going the same place I'm going. And some of them coming back and yelling out to me why didn't you tell me why didn't you tell me why didn't you try why didn't you fight why didn't you why didn't you tell me i i want to throw a truth out to you about where we're at as a society and and just quite honestly where most of us are at here it is most people most times will not tell you the truth when they believe that that truth is going to cause you pain or them pain. I'm, I'm going to say it again. Most people, most times, will not tell you the truth when they know that that truth is going to cause you pain and more vilely themselves pain because we just want to be like. We want to fit in. We want to be people's friends. We want to make people feel good, and we want ourselves to feel good. I've been told so many times in my lifetime, man, you really offend people. <laughs> you really do. If I've offended you in this room, will you please raise your hand and be brutally honest? If I've said something harsh to you and offensive, please, really, Hi. I don't know if it's depressing or what it is. <laughs> I think at the end of my life, I'm going to regret not telling you something you needed to hear that might have ended our friendship. If it was going to lead you to walk with Jesus and walk closer to God. 
Most people, most times, will not tell you the truth if they think it's going to lead to pain for you or pain for them. We'd rather have peace in the moment and pain come later when it's too big and we can't handle it. Then it does sink you. Stephen, in this text, he loves God and honestly, he loves these people enough to tell them the truth that really sends them into a rage. It's not just any old rage. It's a rage that costs him his life. It's one of those seeds that are planted that I guarantee you 10 and 15 and 20 years later, I don't know how long down the road, when Saul became Paul, right? Do you think he ever thought about the day that he took Stephen down? I bet he did. I, I wonder if Paul, if Jesus was like, I see you coming, Paul, in heaven. I see you. Go on. Stephen's right over there. And I think Paul just has come over to Stephen and just embraces Stephen and says, man, wow, what you said that day, forgive them. I had no idea, no idea. Stephen doesn't shy away from telling the truth, and in it, it causes him pain. And it confronts those people around him and causes them discomfort as well. But he embraces the truth and he shares it anyways. And, you know, it's not easy. But when you're dealing with pain, pain is not easy. Suffering's not easy. But when you're dealing with pain and you're dealing with suffering, you cannot let your pain and your suffering be an excuse for you not to share truth and not to accept truth. I've got this excuse. I've got this pain. Oh, I didn't tell you because I was... Oh, I understand. Don't worry about it. You're going through a lot. We have to be willing to pay the price, the painful price of sharing the truth. There's a cost to it. We must trust that God's plan is bigger than our pain and that no pain is wasted when God's glory is the goal. See, these are the things that make pain a stepping stone rather than this barrier, these things that we just walk around, right? We avoid people. Don't you avoid people? Let's, okay, whoa, that almost got awkward. I almost had to tell them the truth. Oh, I'm glad they didn't ask me if their hair looked good. Glad they didn't ask me if that, if I like that. Glad I didn't, they didn't ask me if they had bad breath. <laughs> glad, glad they didn't ask me if I approved of their journey in life and where they're headed and what they're doing because I'd really have to be on it. Well, you know, we're not good truth tellers a lot of times, are we? We have to trust that God's plan is bigger than the pain and that no pain is wasted when God is the goal and the glory is the, of God is the goal. Uh, this year, I, I, again, I'm going to break it to you again, you're going to face a lot of pain and that pain is either going to be a stumbling block or a stepping stone for God's glory. And your choices are what's going to determine what they are. Your choices. What you do with it. Not the lack of pain. I, I, I've often wondered, I shared this at some point in my message to South, but at some, I wonder what would have happened if the disciples would have never woke Jesus up what they really would have seen in the, 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 the fear and the pain of the storm that was going on. I have two more things that I want to share with you out of our text. and um, you Take a look at verses 54 through 56 of chapter 7. This is the first. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they heard what? They heard in, back in 51, you stiff-necked people, your hearts and your ears are still uncircumcised. And he really brings the heat. When the people, the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and they gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, but just a side note, this is not going to help your cause, Stephen. He sees this. If he would have known what was good for him, he would have just kept his mouth shut and said, oh, cool, thank you. That's awesome. 
But he's so amazed at it. He's so, they're yelling at him. And don't you understand there's a fight that's going on? There's pain that's going on? And Stephen's like, look. He says, I see heaven open, and it's the Son of Man, and he's standing at the right hand of God. Isn't that awesome? He's not rubbing it into them. He's like, wow, look at that. <clears throat> Here is what grabbed me. When you let your pain be God's platform, you get to see what others cannot see. Stephen got to see heaven open. He got to see Jesus, and he got to see God. What do you think that was like? I mean, can you imagine if God split this ceiling? Maybe you're the only one in the room, and he says, I want to show you something, right? I, I want to show you something. You got to see Jesus standing next to God. I think it would be the biggest thing of your day. Maybe your year. Maybe a little more than that even. When you let your pain be God's platform, you get to see things that others cannot see. You know, before Kathy and I married a couple uh, weeks ago, I don't know, several weeks ago, I, I told you a story of how we went to New York, right? And we slid down that slide, killed our ribs and all that kind of stuff in that camp in New York. Well, we stopped um, at Niagara Falls. And I, I'm not going to get all the story right. I had to actually call her and ask her about it. And she, I, I remembered this decision. We were at the top of we we're by Niagara Falls and there was this narrow path that was treacherous like very treacherous and it was down a very a steep it was really really steep it was so steep that they had a cable a climbing cable on this path that you had to literally almost repel you know down this side of the cliff to get down to see whatever was down there and it said the whirlpool you got to see the whirlpool and we debated, is, is the, what we're going to see, is it worth the pain of the path? Right? And we said, let's go for it. You know, we're just driving in a car. We got our climbing gear. Not. Uh, <laughs> we never had climbing gear, but we were younger and crazier, and, you know, and we did. We climbed down there, and it was like, oh, man, if we fall, things are going to happen. Like somebody's literally going to get hurt. Uh, something's going to break. We get down there, so stunning, and it was so amazing. And I remember thinking, boy, it was worth it. Boy, it was worth it. And then the climb up, right? <laughs> the climb up's like, oh, I don't know if it was worth it. You know, Kathy's in front of me, and it was, we weren't married. It was, it was, in, it was good, you know? But it, it was like, you know, it, it, but I, this cable, right? And it was, this is such a, sometimes you go down roads and you think, it's not worth it. I'm tapping out. I'm going to quit. And I, I don't think that I can, you know, sometimes life can send you down such painful roads that you just don't want to keep going. And you don't want to be on so much work to it, so much pain to it, so much suffering to it. But if you will press on and you embrace the journey, if you will, with God's presence, you're going to see things from God that your pain shows you that others don't have the privilege to see. I want you to hang in there. I want you to be encouraged. The pain that you go through this year doesn't have to wreck your life. It doesn't have to cause you to stumble. Last thing I want to share with you is actually in verse 59. It's a big one. I don't like four points in a message. It doesn't matter. There could be eight. I had five. I thought, oh, five. I can't have five. But I narrowed it down to four because every time I looked at the text, there was something else that just grabbed out, jumped out to me. And, and, but it's, this is such a big one. I, I had to share it. Verse 59 of chapter 7. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, 
Do not hold this sin against them. And then he died. I mean, I don't want us to lose what's happening. These guys are so furious, they're smashing him with stones, and he knows it's all over. He's like, Lord, receive my spirit. I think God kept heaven open. I think God had a purpose for his pain. He's like, kept heaven open. I'm, I'm here with you. Lord, receive my spirit. He said, I'm, I'm going to die. And then he has the wherewithal. He falls to his knees because he cannot stand any longer the brunt force of those rocks. And he's on his knees and he says, forgive them. I, I, listen, God's presence in the pain, it not only lets that pain be a stepping stone, but lets us do what others cannot do. It awakens the power of God in us. And I got to thinking that Stephen's last words on earth were not, I hate you all. Repent or you're going to hell. You guys need a relationship with Jesus. It's nothing bitter, nothing anger, angry. It's not even tell my family I'll miss them. It's not, hey guys, keep going with the gospel. His last words were, forgive the ones that are smashing my face in. Please, God, forgive them. And then he dies. Stephen's pain produced a powerful movement of God across the world. And you know, I know that every one of us, we all want to make a difference. We all want to make our, our, our life matter. We want to make our life count. We want to make our mark in this life. Uh, but what are we willing to give up? What are we willing to do to make a, a, a difference for our children and for those other people around us and for the cause of God? What are we really willing to pay to give up and, and to get what God wants to do through us, to make his name known, to, to make our life count and matter? Pain is sometimes the only passage for God's love to pass to those who need it. In Stephen's pain, the power of Jesus was revealed. And I just want you to look at pain a little bit different this year. If you'll stop wishing it away, if you'll stop rejecting it and, and, and maybe flinching so much at it, and instead just simply trust God in it. You don't have to like it. You don't have to pretend it's not there. But if you'll just say, okay, God, this is me. This is what you've given me. But I'm going to be faithful to you no matter what. He does something that's bigger through our suffering than we could ever do in a lifetime of pain-free years. You see, it's not the absence of suffering that the world needs. It's the presence of Jesus. That's what they need. That the world doesn't need you to be perfect and, and sin free. The world needs to know that you're confessing Christ and that Jesus is your righteousness. And he's your song and he's your story. Not that your life is just, hey, once I gave my life to Jesus, everything was great and it's awesome and, and my marriage is great and everything's great. It's just so per I think that we do a disservice to the presence of Jesus by promoting a presence in us that's not real. I love it that Jesus is there with Stephen. He shows up and Jesus is like, I'm here, man. I'm at the right hand of God speaking to the Father in your defense, Stephen. And I love it that Stephen asked for their forgiveness. Of course he does. Because he understands the power of pain and the position he's in. He understands that pain isn't the absence of God. Sometimes it's just the path that God has revealed to the world. And he embraces it. And it, and it ignites a fire that spreads across the world for the gospel like, like a fire spreading across a dry grass field so intense if you're faithful and willing to trust god there's always kingdom purpose in pain 
hang in and don't quit. That's my encouragement to you today. Make pain God's platform. Make it a stepping stone. Don't let it be a stumbling block. Ask for God's help. I, I want to share, the musicians are going to come forward, and, and there's an invitation song that we're given, and, and we're going to sing, and the invitation is pretty simple. I, I just, maybe you're dealing with something, and I think we always are, aren't we? Aren't we always dealing with something that we just need God's help? We just need God to do something? Um, I want to tell you um, a story that I've told some of you. Some of you have never heard this. But um, during the Ebola, um, when I went to um, Liberia, I came back and I got malaria. It was just such bad timing to have malaria. Because malaria has the same symptoms as Ebola. And I remember um, I let it go for like four Four days, if you know anything about malaria, that's the wrong thing to do because the parasite that is malaria grows. And uh, I felt like I aged like 15 years. I'm still, I think I'm still suffering to some degree from that first bout. I was talking with a guy at the Hope Center, Kim, remember John Kim? I was talking with him and I, I was telling him this story. He goes, oh, <laughs> he said, your first time getting malaria is, is just the worst ever. And I spent six days in the hospital. They quarantined the ninth floor of the hospital. And I sat there, and there was no relief. There was no relief from the pain. Every follicle on my head hurt. They took like 49 vials of blood out of me. And I, I was like, why are they? I had 104 temperature for like several days before I even went into the hospital when I just couldn't take the pain anymore. But I remember such a peace and such a powerful message. And it was so intimate and it was so amazing and I can't explain it to you, but it was like God said, I'm letting you have this pain because I want you to see what others are going through that you love, that you're serving you know how many thousands and thousands and thousands of people are dying from malaria around the world and in the country you're in. You know how many people are working in Liberia and in the surrounding countries that are just working with this pain. And they're asking for a tablet. Can I just have a tablet? And it was such a, that pain for me was such a sacred moment. So my encouragement to you as we sing is let's just live in confession. The pain that you're going to go through, the pain that you're going through right now, the pain that you've been through in your life, listen, don't pray, God, take it away. Ask for his presence in it because he has something he wants to reveal to the world and he has something he wants to reveal to you. If you will just say, God, you are my source of peace, not the absence of pain. Make this pain your platform for your glory. Show me something in it. That's the invitation. So if you need to come and just be real before God, you don't even have to talk to me. You're invited just to come forward and just spend some time with God at the altar. Will you stand? Will you come as we sing? darkness we were waiting without hope without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word for the throne of endless glory to
just a quick question before you roll out. What do you think the value of Peter was to the church in the first century? Or in the... Don't you think there was something valuable about him? Like when they had wondered and they questioned and they, Peter walked with Jesus, he bent his faithfulness. Don't you think he has faithfulness? So I want to flash ahead 20 years from now. Okay, 20 years. What is your faithfulness going to be to those people who are wanting to know if there's any truth? Wanting to know if there's any hope? Wanting to know if there's any meaning to their pain and suffering. This isn't really tied to my message. It's, it's tied to a, a challenge that I want you to think about. See, if the redeemed aren't faithful, if we're not faithful, then the world is looking at us and they're looking at our message and they're saying, hmm, must be that's really not the answer. So I just want to challenge you, and I want you to really think about your faithfulness. I want you to think about uh, uh, what does God want with our movement in Muncie and around the world? What does God want to do with you, Harvest? I know what he wants. He wants faithfulness. He wants for people to look and say, oh, that's Josh. Man, I just see Josh, you know, 20 years from now. Man, that's Josh. He's working in the community. I'm telling you, it's been a long road. But Josh is just here, you know, and he's just faithful. That's Brian beside him. You know, oh, Brian doesn't have any problems, and you don't know anything about his story. But that's just Brian and Josh. I think there's such value in faithfulness. God has redeemed you. Um, let pain be his platform. I hope you have a good day. Take care.